Okay, hey everybody. Uh, it has been a while since I made one of these, so I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, not a lot of people got back to me about the exam, but those who did seemed pretty confident, so um, I hope the rest of you guys like that too. Should have been uh, well prepared, hopefully. And that's it. Again, we're going to keep rolling with chapter 17 and 18 as much as we can in the time we got left, so uh, let's get to it. Today is uh, the Indiana Jones hat, because finally getting out of the house and going to a drive-in movie tonight. Hopefully that's going to be uh, kind of cool. And uh, I will post this for you guys so it's ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow will be Friday the 29th. All right, so let's talk externalities. I didn't love the definition that they gave or the way they explained it in the book because they did fine talking about a positive versus a negative, but they didn't really say exactly what just an externality is. So I found these. First one is from Investopedia, which I told you is like my go-to. I think it's a great site. An externality, external, outside, uh, a cost or benefit incurred, if it's a cost, or received, if it's a benefit, by a third party that had no control over its creation. Right? They didn't buy anything, they didn't produce anything, but they're still having some impact on them in the terms of a cost or a benefit. I forget where this one's from, but this is good too. It's a side effect, consequence of an activity not reflected. We want to use the term internalized, right? Like, you know, you're not really internalizing uh, that what you did hurt me so bad, right? You might hear that from like a significant other or from your parents. Uh, it's not internalized. It's not taken into account uh, in the cost of the good or service. So you can have two clients. If it's a positive externality, that means somebody's getting a benefit. If it's a negative externality, that means somebody's uh, getting a cost. That's not accounted for. And whether it's a positive or a negative, and it's a benefit or cost, it could be a result of production or consumption. Happens when somebody makes something, happens when somebody buys something. All right? Uh, and I'm going to show you in later videos or later exercises and whatever um, how to sketch all those situations or how to identify the situation based on a sketch and how to do some other things with it later on. But real quick, a uh, couple examples, so you'll be better prepared to do that ditto uh, that you uh, hopefully have in front of you uh, a little bit later. Okay, um, there's a bakery that smells really good while they're baking their goods, and people walk by and smile and get hungry and whatever. Um, so that is a good thing, right? That's a positive externality. They're getting a benefit that they had nothing to do with, they didn't buy anything, and that's coming about because of production. So that's a positive externality in terms of production. Um, Mr. Bennett, my old neighbor as a kid growing up, uh, would always do these really beautiful gardens in the spring and the summer, and people would pass by and smell and smile and would, I don't know, maybe increase our property value. That again, that's a positive thing, that's a benefit, right? Um, now you might say he is producing a garden, but he's actually consumed the flowers. He had to buy all the flowers and mulch and the fertilizer and blah, blah, blah. So that's a positive externality in terms of consumption. Um, if your neighbor um, has a bunch of crazy teenage kids and they're throwing all these crazy parties and throwing uh, empty beer cans over your fence and into your yard, or maybe they have a fire pit and the ashes or the um, embers are coming into your lawn and maybe start a fire, well, that's a negative thing, right? And that's a negative thing because uh, there's a cost to you because those crazy kids are consuming um, the beverages and the fire and whatever else. And the, the most basic example is there's a plant that makes whatever they make tires um, and they're producing toxic waste in the meantime. That's obviously negative. There's a cost and that's coming from uh, a, produ a production decision. Okay. Um, so let's check my notes. All right, so the, the classic example that we're going to start with is pollution, right? Pollution's bad, right? Yes, I think we would all agree with that. Some of you guys uh, have done experiments in the past to, to try to reduce uh, pollution. So, yeah, pollution's bad. We'd like there to be less of it, right? Should we get rid of all of it? I'm going to turn that light. It's kind of annoying. I can't keep the light on without the fan. Or can't keep the fan on without the light. Um, we'd like to get rid of pollution, right? Should we get rid of all pollution? No. If you think about it for a second, no. First of all, impossible. Second of all, just doesn't make economic sense, right? There is some benefit to pollution, right? Before you call, you know, the the um, 
you know, National Recycling Department of America and have them get on me. There is some benefit to pollution, right? Um, the benefit of pollution is not having to pay or um, take steps to get rid of the pollution or avoid it in the first place, right? Um, so just like everything else in society, it's a trade-off. Yes, pollution is bad, but getting rid of all of it costs something. So you got to figure out when is enough pollution okay that will allow some of it, but it can go too far, right? Just like any, anything else we do in economics, right? There's a certain point to it. You could also get into the conversation of um, what do we really consider pollution? Is pollution anything that is left over when you produce something? Does a squirrel uh, cracking open a nut and leaving the shell leaving the shell there after it's done eating is that really pollution? You know, that's it's a little bit more philosophical, I guess. Um, but anyway, there, there is a optimal level of pollution, even though some of us might say, no, we've got to get rid of all pollution. There is an optimal level, and that's what we're going to take a look at now. All right, so let me just pause, clear the board, and we'll be back with you in a second. Okay, so just like everything we've done all year, money, price goes on the side or on the vertical, y-axis, units, whether it's of output of cars or in this case pollution, tons of toxic waste or carbon emissions or whatever, goes on your x-axis. The cost curve is easier to think about, right? You pollute more, it costs society more. More pollution, more of a cost, that's easy. And that's a cost to all of society. So that's marginal social cost. The next unit, what it's costing society, MSC. The marginal social benefit is a little trickier to wrap your head around because again, we're thinking pollution bad. Who benefits really, who's really the only one who benefits from either not having to stop themselves from polluting um, or not having to clean up their pollution is really just the firm that's polluting, right? So that marginal social benefit is really just for the polluter, all right? So when they don't have to clean up any pollution whatsoever or stop themselves from polluting at all, that's got a very high benefit. But think about marginal utility, right? Each additional unit that they pollute, they're not getting as much for it, right? And it's not benefiting them as much. So their curve looks like our normal demand curve, and that's marginal um, social benefit. So you're obviously, before you do anything else, you think X marks the spot, economics, sweet spot right there. Uh, that's where society would want to be. But if there's no government regulation, how much is this uh, firm going to pollute and get their marginal social benefit? Well, you stop when the cost is greater than the benefit, right? Well, there is no cost. So in this case, how much are they going to go? They're going to go until the marginal social benefit hits zero. And after that, they're not getting any more benefit. They're giving benefit back because their, their marginal social benefit is negative. The other way to think about this, I like to go backwards. Right? I think that make, makes it a little bit more logical. If you told this firm, hey, enough's enough. We finally passed some regulation. you got to clean up. right? And you got to clean up two units of pollution. Well, that's like two units. Big deal. If I put a cap on my, my smokestack or I don't know, have the employees lost the floor. I don't know. But it doesn't cost them that much. But the more and more that they've got to reduce pollution, the harder and harder it becomes. After you've reduced almost all of your pollution, to finally get those last couple of units is really tough and really going to cost you a lot. Okay? Uh, an analogy I like to use, right? Um, you know, guys, I like to, to use my analogies whenever I can. Think about losing weight, right? Some of us have put on a couple extra pounds during the, the shutdown and everything. Um, to lose weight, whatever you got to lose, the first couple pounds really isn't that hard. Eat a little better. Uh, maybe do a little light jogging, uh, a couple push-ups and sit-ups. You can shed a couple pounds pretty quick, right? But if you're somebody who's got to lose a lot, you got to drop like 200 pounds. Even after you drop the first 190, those last 10 are really tough because you've lost so many already. You've done everything you can. It's like, man, what else am I supposed to do here? I've done everything I can, All right? So there you have it. Your marginal social cost of pollution makes more sense, more pollution, more cost. Marginal social benefit is the benefit the company is getting from not having to reduce pollution or to eliminate the pollution or to clean it up, right? The benefit they get from polluting, they get less and less until it goes negative. They would go 
until it hits zero. And as they reduce pollution, it becomes harder and harder to do so, so the price goes up increasingly. Okay, just let me check my notes here. Okay. Okay, so okay. Okay, so we talked about the ministry margin utility. Um, not having to clean up at all gives you a bid benefit, but then it starts to go down. You go until it hits zero. Think about it in reverse. Okay. Uh, how much does it cost you to reduce the first unit? Not much. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that's where society wants to be, right? But with no government regulation, where are you going to end up? You're going to end up here, where your marginal social benefits there, your marginal social cost is there. That's a big gap. And we already established that that's where society wants to be. So guess what, guys? What do we got ourselves? We got a triangle pointing at where society wants to be, which means that's inefficient, that's dead weight or loss. We should try to do something to regulate to get uh, the units of pollution to be whatever that is right there, where there is some benefit for the polluters, there's some cost to the uh, rest of society, right? But those two things are equal. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to pause quick. I'll be right back. All right. So real quick, based on what you know, if I told you that these are both marginal social benefit curves for uh, Rego Inc. and Scantech, two, two producers, right? Who's just straight up better at getting rid of pollution. So there you go. How do we know? If they can pollute with no regulation, they're both going to produce pollute as much as they can here. If they're forced to regulate, or if they're regulated and they're forced to reduce, say that they have to reduce everything. Well, when they reduce everything, that costs Rego way less than it costs Scanlon. Right? So he's just better at it. Right? Um, when they have to reduce everything, it's costing Rigo this much, it's costing Scanlon that much. So whatever Rigo's not going for, he's just better at producing or preventing the pollution from happening in the first place. That's going to come back into play in a few minutes. So please take either the copy that you printed of the sheet I gave you, Chapter 17, Externalities Introduction, uh, or at least be looking at it on the computer. Uh, and we'll go through that first part about identifying the type of externality, and then uh, we'll work on the graphs, so and we'll be done. Okay, so one of the tricks to these situations, um, positive, negative externality, think, is there too much of something or not enough of something? If there's too much of something, right, uh, it means that there is um, a negative in either consumption or production. If there's not enough of something, right, um, hold on a second, if there's too much of something, that's a negative. Um, if there's too few of something, that means it's a positive. There should be more of them, right? So too few, it's positive. Too much, it's a negative. So, let's see. Um, okay, so let's run through it. Uh, first one should be easy. A factory spews toxic gas into the air as it makes its iPhones. Obviously, that's a bad thing, so we know it's a negative, and they're making something, right? So that's negative production. And again, we'll go through the sketches of all these in another video, but I don't want to get... Uh, Make these things too long, about 13 minutes, 14 minutes. Uh, teenagers playing loud music in the park make it difficult for others to enjoy the day. That's also negative. It's annoying other people, too much of it. Uh, but they're consuming the music in this case. Okay, whether they're buying, uh, the uh, downloading the music, buying the CDs, haha, who still does that besides me? Um, or just listening to the music on the radio, they're still consuming it and they're annoying other people. So that's negative consumption. Uh, a homeowner has trash all over, uh, and tires all over their yard. That is nasty. It's decreasing the property value. People shake their head as they walk by. So that's negative and that's consumption. All that stuff they consume and that's why it's out there. They're not actually producing anything. If a firm invests... If a firm invests in a new machine that uh, makes a certain type of product more quickly, right, that's obviously a good thing, and they're producing something, so that's positive production. E is a little annoying, right? 
Uh, school children go to school without immunizations. Now that's obviously a bad thing, so that's negative. The question comes with whether it's um, consumption or production, right? The answer is consumption, okay? Um, right? And the, the tricky part of that is we're not talking about the consumption of the immunizations. In that case, it would be positive. There's not enough people getting the immunizations. In this case, they're talking about they're consuming the education, right? So that's not a great one. Maybe I should erase that one for next year. But obviously, the key part is that too many kids go to school without the immunizations, unless you are of a certain bunch of religious beliefs. It's a negative. And in this case, case we're talking about consuming the education. So that's a negative in terms of consumption. Uh, a neighbor decorates his home for the holidays tastefully. People drive by and like to look at it and it makes them happy. So that's positive. And they had to consume all that stuff, right? They had to purchase all their Santa statues and lights and dancing reindeer or whatever it might be. Right? And G, a neighbor leaves their barking dog outside all night. That's annoying. That's a negative. And it's, again, consumption. The dog's not producing anything besides noise, right? But they purchase the dog and... You know, say that they are, they're technically consuming the, the love of their animal, whatever. Okay? Uh, we'll do more with that later on. I want to get to the stuff about pollution and the regulation of pollution. Okay? So if you feel like, wait a second, I'm still a little shaky on uh, positive, negative, and consumption uh, production, I promise you we'll do more of that in the, another video. All right? Let's get to the uh, ways that you can regulate the polluter. Because it goes better with what we just did about how certain firms are better at reducing pollution than others. Um, and that should be enough for today. All right. So hold on one sec while I get the other graph up. Okay. So I know that seems like two seconds. This is like the most annoying thing I've ever had to draw in my life. <laughs> um, like kingdom for Promethean board. All right. So here's what you're looking at. Let's take a look. Uh, according to the graph above, how much pollution would each firm produce if there was no government regulation. They're all going to go as far as they can. They're going to go to 100, all firms. Even though it doesn't ask you this, which firm is just plain old better at eliminating pollution? Firm B is, right? When they produce, when they reduce all of their pollution, it only costs them 50, as compared to firm A, when they reduce all their pollution, it costs them 100. So firm B is just better. And that's where the next part comes into play. How much would an emissions standard, how much would emissions be reduced if the emissions standard was created at 55 tons? If you said 55, Berlin Wall, can't go past it. Once you've polluted 55 units, you're done. No more. You're out. Okay, so both firms would reduce from 100 to 55, which means both firms would be down 45. So you would have reduced pollution altogether by 90 tons. It's pretty good. But is that efficient? Think about that for a second. Okay, while you were thinking, I put in what that means for these two firms. Right, the Commonwealth 55, firm A has a greater benefit than firm B, right? Their marginal social benefit then is 45, firm A. Firm B, their marginal social benefit benefit is 22.5. Now you can probably see that more clearly on your sheets than you know this mess up here. All right, but that's not efficient because you're basically punishing the one firm for being better at reducing pollution. They're reducing pollution at a better clip, right? And yet, when you do this emission standard, even though it looks equal, they both reduce pollution by 45 units, tons. Since they're better at it, now their marginal social benefit is only 22.5. And the other firm, who isn't as good, their marginal social benefit is 45. That's not efficient. So what's something else you might try? You also might try a $30 tax per ton of emissions. Now you've got costs involved. Right, so now instead of going all the way to 100 units and polluting as much as they possibly can, because there is no cost, now there is a cost. How much does it cost? About $30, right? So you're going to pollute 
until your benefit is no longer greater than your cost of $30. Okay? So where is firm A going to stop? Firm A is going to stop at 70 because at that point, their marginal social benefit is no longer greater than their marginal social cost or their marginal cost of 30. Okay? So if they're going to reduce from 100 to 70, so the one firm is going to be down 30. Uh, firm B is going to stop earlier. They're going to stop at 40 because after 40, now their marginal benefit, social benefit, is less than their cost of 30. So they're going to do 40, and that's the difference between 100 and 40 is 60. So both situations, you're reducing pollution by the same amount, 90 units. Right? But what you're doing is you're making it more efficient, more fair, really, right? because this firm's going to stop when it works best for them. This firm's going to stop when it works best for them. Right? And then you can get into the whole idea of uh, and in both cases, they're going to stop where their marginal social benefit is equal to their marginal social cost. And then later, we'll get into the idea of, well, because this firm's just better at doing this, there's something called tradable vouchers, where basically if you get people tickets to pollute, and this ticket grants you one ton of pollution, right? If you're better at getting rid of your pollution, you might say, you know what? I'll get rid of the pollution on my own. I'll sell these tickets to that other firm. That's not so good, and you know there'll be more beneficial trades that can occur that way. We'll do that some other time. The idea here is that an emission standard reduces the amount of pollution the same as a tax does, but it's inefficient because it gives one firm a greater benefit than the other firm, right? And if you do it with a um, a per unit tax, you do the same thing. Except now it's more efficient because each firm is doing what is best for them to make their marginal benefit equal to their marginal cost. All right. really hate to erase this because it took me like 20 minutes to make. Uh, but I'm going to do a quick one of the thing on the back. Uh, I might not be as detailed because we just don't need to be for the one on the back. And then we'll be done. 22 minutes. That's not so bad. Okay, so just about done. Uh, this is probably taken... Twice as long as any video for me because of restarts and uh, having to erase and redraw that, that graph a couple times. But for us, for you, it might be turning out to be one of our shorter ones. Okay? So here we have a situation where your marginal social benefit is not equal to your demand. Okay? So we'll do more of this when we get to um, externalities in terms of production and consumption. Right? And, and you'll learn about what it means when you have two demand curves that look alike or two supply curves that look alike. Did they hear the meowing? Uh, they heard you just say, do you hear the meowing? <laughs> and I'm not starting again. <laughs> Sorry, that's my wife asking about whether you heard the cat's meowing. So if you can see uh, two things that look like demand curves, that means that something's going on with consumption. Okay, if you see two things that look like supply curves, that means something is happening um, with production. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so if your demand is lower than your marginal social benefit, that means that you want to be here. Here's where society wants to be. Here's where society is at. Okay? And we know this from before. How do you get demand to be greater? In this case, you'd have to give a subsidy. You get uh, a subsidy when you're at war or something. You do uh, a tax when you want to get less of something. Right? The only thing that's a little tricky about this one is you're talking about wages so you have to kind of reverse your thinking. You're talking about the demand, not for a product, the demand for types of workers, right? In this case, I think it's one of software engineers, right? Um, yeah, you're talking about price of computers. Yeah, computer software engineers, all right? So obviously, we'd rather have more of them. You don't have enough because they're not getting paid enough, right? Uh, so society's going to end up here. Well, we'd be better off if they were here. Okay, we should have about, I'm not even going to look at the numbers right now because that's annoying, uh, but we should have between that quantity and that quantity, we should have that many more computer software engineers, but they're not getting paid enough, right? So if you gave them a subsidy and said, here, employers will give you money, you give it to the, uh, as far as the salary, 
for the software or for the um, computer engineers, that will get society to where they want to be. Well, how much of a subsidy do you need to give them? We, we did this before with taxes, guys, right? How do you get them from here to here? Well, what's the difference? The vertical distance anywhere between your marginal social benefit curve and your demand curve, when they're uh, parallel straight lines like that, it's always going to be the same. So I only put in the numbers that you needed, because that's the only ones you need. And I've already drawn enough cash for today, right? So you need to give them the difference between 1,000, I'm sorry, 100,000. Uh, and 80,000 is 20,000. So you get a $20,000 subsidy, um, and that'll shift your demand curve. They'll demand more of these things. Again, it's a positive externality, because there's not enough of something, positive externality, in terms of consumption. But here it's weird, because you're consuming the computer software engineers. That's what makes it demand. Two demand-looking curves. That means something's going on with consumption. Right? And because there's not enough, we're here when we want to be here, uh, that means that it is a positive externality. These guys are bringing more to society, to the table, to life in general, than uh, is being internalized at this point. There should be more of them. Let's give those companies 20000 bucks. That'll get the demand curve shifted over, and that'll take care of that externality. The cost will be internalized and society will be where it wants to be. All right, so that's it. 26 minutes, not too bad. Uh, only work for today is to fill out those sheets and show me that you did it, all right? So you don't even have to think. Just watch and, and fill in what I say, and uh, and that's it, all right? Like I said, we're, we're trying to take it easy on you. I'm giving you today and the weekend, all right? And then we'll, we'll pick it back up next week. Uh, those of you who still need to be uh, making it work, please do so. Um, no offense, but I got better things to do than email and, and call parents all day. All right. Um, at any point, hit me with questions. Um, whatever you're submitting, you're still going to get some credit no matter how far back in time it was due. All right. I want to get you guys through um, and hopefully hold somewhat of our academic integrity together. All right. So uh, that's it. Um, I'll, I'll be making more of these next week and uh, stay well.